It's time now for the Oakland County Megacast Holiday Special on Civic Center TV, 88.1 WBFH The Biff, and 89.3 Lakes FM. Welcome to the Megacast Holiday Special. I'm Erica Jones. Nothing says Christmas quite like Santa on a sleigh. We got the chance to catch up with the big guy in the sky this week on the Megacast. And don't forget to leave your milk and cookies out for him on Christmas Eve. Santa is busy at work. COVID-19 and the pandemic has not stopped him joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. The man in the big red suit himself, Chris Kringle, thank you for being with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me this year. So as Santa... I didn't know um, because of COVID if some of your reindeers could possibly be taking a little bit of break or if you've had any reindeer sick, but if so, I'm willing and able to, uh, to help you with your services. I can navigate your sleigh. See, I have a reindeer outfit. I'm ready to go. You're looking pretty good. Now, does that nose light up? Uh, so I have a separate antlers. Oh, there you go. See, so if it's foggy, I I could be your backup. Absolutely. Looking pretty good there. Santa, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. I love your backdrop. And uh, Santa, you are a bright light in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, let uh, What's going on? Are you excited for the big night? Absolutely. Very excited for the... For the big night, you kidding? It's I got goosebumps. I got if I didn't have these long sleeves on, you could probably see the goosebumps popping out of my arms right now. It's a lot of fun. You, and you but you think over all these years of Santa Clausing and going every Christmas Eve that you know maybe maybe lose its luster after so many so many years and so many Christmas Eves. But actually, Christmas Eve is and remains my absolute favorite night of the year every year. So what's going to be different this year, Santa? Nothing's going to be different for me. We're going to work. We're, we're going on as scheduled, as planned, just like every other year. So uh, Santa Claus uh, joining us here on the Oakland County Megacast because the one thing that's been great about the uh, outcome of COVID nineteen and the pandemic is we've all upped our game when it comes to Zoom. Santa, I have to ask you, did it take you a while to get the technology down or did your elves have to help you? Well, the elves are there for me, but they're, they're about as far behind as I am. But Mrs. Claus, is, is, she's up to speed. She keeps me, she keeps me going on Zoom and uh, I'm, I'm not as tech savvy, but I'm working my way in that direction. Santa has gone uh, to Zoom. And with that, uh, Santa, what's the big toy this year that everyone is asking for? Oh, there's so many toys. There's a, let's, let me, let me think. There's a, the Paw Patrols has a new game out. There's always Legos and uh, Light Bright and Barbies. I believe there's a, a soft Yoda figure this year and uh, Paw Patrols, I think, mentioned a game. And there's another, there's another toy out there. Very interesting. I think it was probably submitted by one of the, uh, but a parent somewhere in the world. It's called, it's called Poopalot's Wagtails. It's uh, what it is. It's an interactive pet for uh, for boys and girls who have to take care of this this pet. And one of the things they do, they've got to feed their pet and take care of it. And after they're finished feeding the pet, they're going to take care of the the uh, droppings because because the pet actually actually poops. So they got to learn to pick up poop. That's a Strange concept, but I like I said, I think a parent may have come up with that one to uh, so let them know if we ever get a real dog, you're gonna have to take care of that one. So in the meantime, try this one out. Yeah, and the uh, that pet's going to be a lot easier Absolutely. than the real pet. Let me tell you. Absolutely. So uh, Santa, uh, could you give us a little bit of your secret? Uh, I know you get a lot of cookies and milk on Christmas Eve, uh, what's your favorite? Oh, I, I love cookies. You know, I, I think I might be the original cookie monster. And uh, Mrs. Claus makes cookies during the holiday season, lots and lots of cookies. She makes schnickerdoodles and Russian tea cakes and, uh, you know, all sorts of, you know, other yummies, uh, the peanut butter blossoms. But I think 
probably my around this time would be the uh, the cutout cookies with the icing on top and some sprinkles. Those are very good, very good. And you know what, Mrs. Claus, funny story. Last week she she came out with a big tray of these these cutout cookies and put them in front of me. She said, "Here, Santa Claus, take these back and uh, and share them with the with the elves when you get a chance." I said, "Absolutely, I will." She came back a few minutes later. She had with some with some big glasses of uh, milk and she looked down at the tray. She said, "Santa Claus." What happened? There's so many of these cookies are gone. I said, well, I, it's a mystery. Maybe some of the elves came in and then took someone I wasn't looking. She came a little bit closer to me and she, she looked at me. She said, Santa Claus, your, bill, your beard has got cookie crumbs in it, as big as nickels. I don't think those uh, elves had anything to do with the missing cookies. We both had a, had a big laugh and uh, she wasn't too upset with me. So <laughs> I have to say, I'm about to make... Um, our holiday tra tradition, because I'm from Ohio, so we're making Buckeyes. Have you ever tasted Buckeyes, Santa? Absolutely, I have. You got the peanut butter and the chocolate outside. Those are nice. That's a nice cookie. We'll be making those tomorrow with the old family recipe. Uh, it, it, Santa, how are the reindeers doing? The reindeer are very fit. They're fit and ready to go. You know, they're they're well rested. Well rested. A lot of the boys and girls think. You know, when I want to go to visit, they say, Santa Claus, you know, where are the reindeer? Are they up on the roof? Are they out in the street? And I tell them, no, they're, of course not. They're back in the North Pole. I said, they only, they only fly one time a year. And of course they say, well, well, how did you get here then, Santa Claus? And I, and I tell them, well, lots of boys and girls, when I meet them, they'll keep in contact with me over the years, even into when they get to be adults and have children of their own. And they'll contact me, they'll call me, they'll email me say, Santa Claus, if you're in town, I can, I've got a card that you can use and you can go make visits with that. And I, I thought that's a fun idea. And I'm, I'm very thankful. And, uh, and that happens a lot. So boys and girls, keep in contact when you get older. I might be visiting you when you get older. <laughs> what about the elves? How are they doing? Busy year for them? Uh, they're very busy. That's a fun love, fun loving group, hardworking and fun loving. And they're very supportive, you know, of our mission, you know, to get the, uh, Bring joy and happiness to boys and girls all around the world. All around the world, they they're loving it and they join right in. And they work very hard throughout the year. They have some fun though. I was going to say they seem like a very playful group. Yeah. How do you rein them in to get productivity out of the elves? Well, I, quite honestly, I'm more of a facilitator. Mrs. Claus, uh, she's pretty good at putting her heel down when it's necessary because she's she watches the clock. She says, Santa. You boys, you guys got to get after it. You boys and girls and all you elves, you better get to it because Christmas Day is coming pretty quick. So she's uh, she makes sure we stay on the job. Mrs. Clossy, every mister needs a missus behind him absolutely. to get things done and to keep them on track. Yes, yes, and absolutely. She's And Mrs. Claus is, you know, always cheerful, always very nice and very giving. And she loves to make these uh, home visits with me you know, before the, as, you know, as the holiday season progresses, she, cause she loves to get out and meet the boys and girls, but she's always there for me. And she's, you know, always uh, takes care of me and make sure that I'm, that I've got everything I need. Santa, can I ask you something? Can you share a secret with me? Go ahead, ask. Just between the two of us, how do you fit down the chimneys? It's magic. It's a magic. It's a ma I can't show all of that, but of course it's magic. I'm a big guy. And uh, these, some of these chimneys are only this big around. So yeah, there's a lot of magic involved there. But uh, magic, you know, it's a one, it's a once a year thing too. So you won't be seeing, won't be seeing me coming down chimneys throughout the year, just one time. With that, uh, hey, when Christmas is over and you get to take a break, do you watch any of these Christmas movies? Well, I wish I had more time to watch television. I'll tell you what, but Mrs. Claus and I. You know, we're up to our elbows all the time with uh, things to do, you know, and the last minute preparations, of course, coming into it. And, uh, you know, there's always the, uh, you know, checking my list twice, you know, before it's all over. But uh, I, I would think if there was a, a favorite movie, holiday movie that I like would probably be the uh, the original version of the, the, what is this? Miracle on 34th Street with Edmund Gwen playing my role. He's, he does a nice job. He does a good job. And that's a classic. That's a classic. So that's probably be my favorite. It is very much a classic. I will say I like Frosty the Snowman too. That's a good story. That's a good story. I'd sing it for you, but I'm not a very good singer, uh, Santa. 
everywhere I go, I say, okay, we're going to sing together, but I don't want all those voices drowning out old Santa Claus because he's no Frankie Sinatra. And they, they try hard. They try hard, but I can always seem to hear my own voice. So uh, Santa, I will say, I know you don't have a lot of time, and maybe this is kind of a question for Mrs. Claus, but the de big debate this year is who has the better Christmas shows, Hallmark or Lifetime? Oh, uh, well, again, you know what? You hit that right on the head because uh, if there was a, a show like that on television, Mrs. Claus would be watching and taking notes. So I couldn't speak to that. Well, it's so fun having you with us here because I know you're super, super busy as we go into the holiday season. The countdown is on. What do you want to say to the kids that may be watching right now? Well, I guess my message will be, as always, you know, be kind to, to others, listen to your parents, work hard in school, believe in yourself, and, you know, always never give up on your dreams. Never give up on your dreams. That's been my message to all boys and girls around the world. Santa, we appreciate you taking time to visit us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. So when do you take off? When does your magic start? Well, the magic, the magic starts, you know, not to we, not to we leave the ground and uh, it's, we're preparing for it. Everybody's getting pretty anxious. And uh, once we leave the ground, the magic begins. Well, just a reminder, if something happens to one of the reindeer and you need a backup, I'm here for you. See, I can lead the sleigh. I see those lights. I see them. You might just work out. <laughs> Something happens, I'll contact you. Santa, thank you for taking time out to be with us. Thank you again for having me. It's been my pleasure. I don't know about you, but I always have a huge sweet tooth around the holiday season. And what's more, Friendship Circle recently bought delicious local bakery, Dakota Bread. Friendship Circle founder, Bassi Shemtov, checked in with the Megacast to talk all about the tasty new traditions of the bakery. I know I'll be stopping by this week. Joining us now on the Oakland County Megacast is Bassi Shemtov. She is with the Dakota Bread Company and the Friendship Circle. Great to have you with us. Thank you. I know that we've talked a little bit before about Dakota Bread. I love what you guys are doing over there. Bring us up to date. Yeah, so we are now open just over probably six weeks um, since we purchased Dakota Bread. And it has been, I have to say, the, one of the most incredible rides Friendship Circle has taken so far. Um, and the coolest thing that I could say is that it feels like the entire community is rejoicing and celebrating in this acquisition. And having that sense that we really are a family has been overwhelming in a very positive way. You know what? It's so nice to hear that because it's some positivity, something good, where it can feel overwhelming for people and, you know, with all the negative news and it can be heavy at times. So this is so uplifting to hear. It's it's awesome. Like, honestly, I like to just have to be at Dakota to like, have meetings, even though it's COVID. So we've got to be careful. I have to exit the store, come back in. But just to be around that energy of people walking in excited to buy bread because it's Friendship Circle, it's really it's special. They're supporting a great cause. The real team. When I, I just think like there is nothing like the smell of bread baking. It is incredible. Yeah, it really is. So uh, with that, tell us a little bit more about the process and who you hire and how you actually get the bread out to the public. So at the, the first month or so, we really focused on just taking the business and keeping it to the great business that it has been before we purchased it, um, making sure that we got all the kinks out just once you know, turning, changing hands, making sure that everything is being done the same way because all of the challah and all of the bread is the exact same. And thank God people have just been literally buying it off the shelves and loving it. So that has been awesome. The part that we are really, that we just started piloting three weeks ago, we just started, was to pilot and bring individuals with special needs to train them to work in the bakery. And one of the, the best like little sound bites that we got from one of our participants, Sam Morris. He's one of our trainees. 
after the first day of being trained, he before he went into his car, he told our trainer, Lisa, I'll be back in 45 hours. You know, it's every other day. So it's 45 hours to the exact minute later. Um, and that's Sam. You know, Sam has his time and his calendar. Really, he knows it really well. Super social and so genuinely excited to work and to do a good job. Focus. So we have our training program that's a six-week program, and we are, we are already discussing what we're going to do in January because that's when our pilot six-week program is over. And giving adults with special needs the opportunity that they otherwise do not have to come work in a typical bakery alongside every other typical staff person is, is an opportunity that's miraculous. And when you see the growth you know, pretty quick growth, although they need a lot, you know, a lot of our individuals with special needs needs a, need a lot of practice and consistently practice repetitive tasks over and over until they get it right. They're learning. They're learning. They're learning with re, through respect and through space and, and really understanding what needs they have. If they are getting anxious, give them a break. So it's just, it's just the beginning and we are really on a very good road to having a, a good program happen over here. And you know, it, it probably means so much to them as well, but how is the training going during this COVID time? You know, one of our participants have those, you know, the, that like literally spaceship headgear with the oxygen blowing. So one of them uses that because he's very anxious with the pandemic. Um, the other three that are currently in this, in this uh, training program, they're wearing their masks, um, and we, you know, we're being as we're being careful. Everyone's just being as safe as possible, um, and really monitoring everything. And thank God it's been it's been okay. But it's a much smaller group because of COVID. Uh, we're going slower and just not jumping into it, making sure everyone's comfortable. Um, obviously, this is a family decision, but just like anybody else is working, they also have to get out and get to work. How many loaves of bread do you guys make each, each and every day? <laughs> I've heard I've heard the twelve hundred mark a day. Wow. So what time do they get in there in the morning? We have one uh, one of the lead bakers are there at two a.m. and the crew is there as early as five six in the morning. Oh my goodness gracious! And this is open uh, to the public, right? Yeah, this is open to the public. It's open Monday through Friday. And we have everything from the regular pastries and breads and pala that everybody knows Dakota bread for. Um, and we also now just put up our special Friendship Circle Soul Center display of some of the artwork translating into like gift boxes and tin cans with our special uh, newest edition of our Sweet Hugs cookie. So uh, what's, a, what's a Sweet Hugs cookie? So Sam Morris as well is one of our known artists at Soul Center, at the Soul Studio. And he created this great image that has really been spread all over of two people, stick figures of two people hugging. And it's in a heart. And then he does lots of other drawings in, with that same style, that same theme. And it's all about love and hearts and happy and positivity. Sam is full of positivity. So we took these, we created these um, cookie cutters and stampers that are hand painted and created a special sweet hugs cookie. And then we, per we ordered these tin, these round tin cans, beautiful, where two of these sweet hugs cookies goes into. So that's like a great Hanukkah holiday, you know, gift that people are purchasing. And we also have another gift box, fully decorated with one of our artists works with Andrew Lipset's work. And in there we have the baked goods with a mug from Ben Hirsch and a little bit of light pushes away a lot of darkness, bread towel from by Leah Pollock. And it's just like an amazing gift box for the holidays. So we have this hall wall of displayed from our participants artwork. And we've gotten really great feedback that coming into Dakota bread now is just like a new look, you know, a new, fresh, happy, positive place to look around while they're waiting in line. Um, and we encourage people to come and 
get those gifts for your friends, family, coworkers, you know, whatever you need it for. Yeah, you know, the talk right now is really about supporting local, but in this way, you're not only supporting local, you're also supporting a great cause. So for those not uh, familiar with the Friendship Circle, give us a little bit of background on that organization. So Friendship Circle began in 94 uh, with just literally eight volunteers and a couple of families that have children with special needs. And the idea was really to give just an hour and a half of respite for our family. Um, and before we knew it, three, four years into Friendship Circle, we had our aha moment. And that was when we found out that this was a win-win and that the reason why we had too many volunteers at the time and not enough children is because the volunteers could not get enough of this incredible, unconditional love, non-judgmental style that we are able to get when we are around people with special needs. Um, and that grew really quickly over the past 26 years. Thank God there are now 90 friendship circles around the country and the world, all following our model here in Michigan. So it, it's really been a, a place where teens, adults, both with special needs and volunteers that are able to connect at a soul level, the way we explain it. You know, the superficial part of the regular day-to-day -day life that we experience in the regular society when you're with somebody that has special needs, a lot of that superficial stuff disappears. And what really matters is what is expressed between that connection. It's the heart to heart, right? Yeah. So with that, uh, Basi, how do you explain to someone with special needs about COVID-19 and not being able to reach out and maybe hug them or touch them it can make for uh, someone has to feel a little uncomfortable, right? Yeah, but it's interesting. You know, when you're talking about the adult community of special needs, they're incredible. They all get it better than the typical adults out there. <laughs> you know, they're more willing to take the law and to take the guidance and to take the safety precautions and say, I'm going to take this seriously. They don't mess around. You know, they're not looking to, to rebel or go against things. They're really, they're cautious. If anything, their anxiety, you know, could be, you know, it, it could be difficult in this kind of time. They are definitely concerned, but it's been great. We've had small pods in our studio and thank God everybody's with their masks, washing their hands, being very careful, socially distant. So they're, they've been incredible. So um, go into a, a, some of those programs that you do have over at Friendship Circle. So we have everything from our soul studio where we have pods of artists that will come the morning session and we divided it so more people get a chance. And then we have an afternoon session of only six artists per time being really careful in our pretty large building. So it's, it's thank God been really safe and it's been working very well. Um, in our At our mirror center with our children's programs, we also have small pods of five, six kids per pod. And all of the staff are constantly socially distant with all the masks, with all the precautions. But thank God we are able to have the in-person, very small and controlled groups, as well as lots of, uh, we still are doing lots of virtual programming that shockingly is, thank God, working really well. And we also do several like packaged pickups. So we have boxes of the art supplies and the artists could come pick it up and then really feel more connected because they're getting the supplies as well as care packages, holiday packages, baking packages. So drive-throughs, just constantly trying to find creative ways to show our children, our families, our volunteers, that we are here as their real family. And we will do whatever we have to, to just connect and have fun and try to kind of overlook the difficulty as much as possible. So, and during this time, getting creative and trying to find different ways to reach out to people. Has there been something that's been positive that you think will stick around with how you do things post pandemic? Very interesting. Um, well, one interesting thing, a little bit off topic, but for the first time, our entire staff for about eight months, just until a few weeks ago, we switched it to weekly. We met every single morning on Zoom and we never had our entire team together. And it actually has done 
a lot of good. Um, it brought us together in a really great, a stronger team family way, as well as got us more creatively thinking of more ideas and what else could we do to help our community. So that was a very interesting thing um, that will definitely help us beyond. Um, and then the connections and relationships, being that we had no choice but to kind of shrink the size of all of our programs, it really gave our incredible staff the opportunity to connect in a very meaningful way because they just had more time on their hands. So, you know, we're going to take what we learned in this very difficult time and hopefully expand on it, grow with it, grow from it, and learn that we're not in control of the world. <laughs> we have all had to take that pause during this time, right? Uh, Basi yeah. Shimtab with us. She's the co-founder of the Friendship Circle. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, how are you dealing with volunteers and fundraising during this time? So lots of hard work, but thank God we have the coolest community here in Michigan. The best, literally the best huge family that anybody could wish for a family that really takes responsibility of the people that live in their community. Um, so with a lot of hard work, thank God, our volunteers are still there doing what needs to get done. Our donors are really keeping up with us. Of course, some are having a more difficult time than others and everybody understands that, but we have other donors that understand that it's more difficult and they're chipping in to really help support and make sure that we could remain strong and be there for the hundreds and some thousands of people that are relying on us. It's like, we don't have a choice. So whatever we have to do, we've got to figure it out to whatever extent we could do it. If we have more support, we could do a little more, but we, we've got to be there. So I know that in years past, uh, you would also uh, do the big walk um, yeah. to bring people together. Were you able to do that this year? Thank God we were. We did the sign still. Uh, our families, most of them, were still able to work really hard and pull in those funds. Uh, we did it differently. It was basically done virtual, but kind of a, a hybrid. We went and dropped off activities from bounce houses to entertainers to music to food, uh, dr uh, drive through breakfast. So we really tried to keep the components that we always had. It was different. And to be honest, some parts of it were really interesting. Every family had their own mini walk in their communities and their subdivisions. And it was just a very heartwarming kind of feeling. Again, showing that we're here no matter what. Yeah, I live off of the West Bloomfield Trail. Ooh. And so we saw a, a group on the trail during that time as well. But um, going forward, do you think that you were able to manage and grow in some regards during this time because of your relationship that had already been established with the community? Dakota Bread happened a few months ago. <laughs> the entire idea of Dakota Bread happened during this pandemic, which is crazy. And during this pandemic is when the entire community stood up and said, we are here with you and they made this happen. So, you know, where the challenging times of COVID is crazy and difficult and, and we continue to pray for all of those who are not well right now and hope that we are end this craziness. Um, at the same time, thank God we've got to keep going. We, we can't get depressed and, and, and kind of slow down. And instead we sped up and it's all meant to be, but thank God we have Dakota Bread and it's already giving young adults with special needs an amazing opportunity and bringing our community together, which is part of our mission. Do you still sit back and think, um, how did this happen? Like if, if they came to you six months ago to talk about taking over Dakota bread, would you have been like, yeah, no. totally. but to have it happen so quickly and in, in yeah. the middle of a pandemic, crazy, kind of a miracle, right? It, a real miracle for real, like no doubt. So uh, with that, just another minute or two with you here on the mega cast, um, what do you want the public to know that um, about you and your organization and the people that you're serving? That I personally and my family would join me in saying this and our staff would join me. And I believe everyone that has the opportunity to be 
to have a meaningful relationship with an individual with special needs, I really would encourage everyone, bring some more meaning into your life. Learn what it means to look at somebody without judgment and learn to show, have unconditional love towards somebody. The blessings and the, 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 the true inner sense of fulfillment that you, will, that you will feel by having that connection and that relationship will hopefully, I believe, translate and help you in other parts of your life. So every single person that is in, is in this world for a reason, every single person was created for a unique purpose and mission and individuals with special needs continue to teach hundreds and thousands of people that allow them in their world. So all of you businesses, I would really also recommend, think about hiring somebody with special needs to your team. You will make your place a better place to work, a more successful place to work. Um, so that's really my message to share. You, you know, with that, um, you mentioned the individuals with special needs themselves. But what does this mean to the family members? If I would, if I could put myself in their shoes, which I know you can, um, but I would imagine just think about my own children. You know, when somebody really um, brings my child into their life and really appreciates them for who they really are and respects them for who they really are, what kind of joy that brings to us parents? So I could just imagine that having a child with special needs possibly years ago and maybe even still might bring some you know, discomfort or concern or not sure how they're gonna be accepted in the world. I'm sure this is something that is vital to their existence to know that hopefully more and more people are learning about the incredible, um, the incredible, incredible importance and of having people with special needs in your world. And I hope more of us realize that and, and actually take steps to bring them in because it's for our sake as well as for theirs. Well, it is so great to, the work that you and your team members are doing over there to uh, make the world a better place. I've been by Dakota Bread since our last conversation. It is amazing. I'm, there are a few things better than freshly baked bread. So yeah. thank you to you and your team. And we hope that uh, you continue to grow and to thrive during this time as well. Thank you so much for having me. The last few seasons for Detroit sports teams have been looking pretty rough, but things may finally be looking up with new management and completely reinvented rosters. Ronnie and Tyler recently got the chance to check in with a longtime sports radio host, Matt Derry. We are going to start off the show today. The news broke earlier this week. The Cleveland Indians are going to be getting rid of the nickname the Indians, much like the Washington Redskins have recently done. And to talk a little bit more about that and so many other things sports related, let's bring in longtime Detroit sports radio host and lifetime Cleveland Indians fan, Matt Deary here with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Matt, were you devastated by the news or did you anticipate it was going to be coming? Hey, Ronnie, good to see you. Um, no, I, I, I don't think I was, uh, you know, devastated or surprised i i was prepared for it i think over the last couple of years this is kind of where this has been going uh, with team names um as a tribe fan myself uh if you can see back here i got my uh, indians flag back here i don't know am i allowed to take that down or keep that up i don't know but you know it's weird because you're right the chief law who kind of represents us as indians fans and it's and it's always been this happy sort of symbol i understood a few years ago when they took it away uh, and Major League Baseball and the Indians kind of decided, let's kind of shy away from it. It, it, it. Native Americans and, and, and certain others viewed it as disrespectful. And now, you know, we've kind of come full circle. they have actually changing the name. You mentioned before the word Redskins. Um, boy, what a slur. It really is. And I thought Washington spent way too many years defending it. Indians, maybe not as much a slur, but I do understand that, that, that this is where we are and, and, and kind of moving on from it. I always wonder about what's going to happen to all the merchandise. I know, right? My, that's what my wife said. She, uh, uh, we got a, I got a lot of a lot of gear, but um, you know, I, I would think right now people would be scooping it up and buying it, and then of course when the new name comes in, that people would be uh, running to get that too. It's, it's a 105 year tradition. It's part of me is very sad about it, but I do understand. But with that too, what do you think they are? Um, 
going to rename it? Are they going to just drop a nickname like Washington did? Well, first of all, Ronnie, if it's Cleveland baseball team, I'm going to, I'm going to throw up. I'm, I, <laughs> come on. Can we get a name? They said next year for 2021, whenever baseball starts back up, that they will be the Indians for one more year. So that it should give them plenty of time to rebrand and come up with it. Uh, the Spiders is a name that's popular because that was the original name of the team back in the 1800s before they changed to Indians. Me, myself, personally, you're having me on the show. I hate it. Please don't. Spiders, really? Come on now. I think Barons wouldn't be bad. In the mid-70s, the uh, city of Cleveland had a hockey team, uh, and it was three years in the NHL, the Cleveland Barons. They had a cool logo. Uh, if I had to, had to make a vote, I would go vote for Barons because there's a history there. So, uh, Tyler, do you want to jump in on this conversation? You're the sports fan here. Yeah, definitely <laughs> the approach has been different for the Cleveland Indians franchise and their rebranding, getting away from this, from their current nickname, which has been their nickname since 1914, uh, but has grown to be a, grown to be known as offensive to the general population and that's why they're shying away from this and taking a much different approach to it altogether than the Washington football team had after years of backlash their owner Dan Snyder being very much denial in denial about changing that name or, or any desire to change it until mo the most recent events of 2020 and then the Cleveland Indians taking a different approach where they're much more welcoming to that they're hearing the voices of the public and then as they go into the rebranding they are doing so in a gradual fashion to avoid that one-year gap period where they have themselves be known as the Cleveland baseball team or some or something of some other <laughs> sort of some other sorts. Right. Speak to the difference in approach between what Cleveland is taking versus what the Washington football team is taking, and how that may help that the fan base of the Cleveland of Cleveland's baseball team transition into this new era. Uh, from your own personal ang angle as a lifelong Cleveland Indians fan and from just a general sports fan's perspective, knowing what the Washington football team's fans are going through right now with their team being called the Washington football team. No, Tyler, I think you bring up a lot of great points. Um, number one, I think the approach of ownership. Uh, you know, a lot of Indians fans complain about Paul Dolan, the owner, for not spending enough money and being cheap and everything else. But with that being said, he's a first-class human being, and he – Listen to the fans. He listened to the Native American uh, um, uh, individuals that for years were protesting outside the stadium, whether it was opening day, whether it was during the World Series five years ago. Uh, and he's listening to them. And, and, and he, they sat down and they said, all right, we're going to make the consideration of changing. Then they sat down with local Native American leaders, national leaders, and they made the determination that this was the right thing to do. Snyder and the Redskins folks treated this like a joke for years. Um, people were saying, it's a slur, your logo is a slur, and they just kept bump, bump, bumping it off, bumping it off, until major sponsors, you know, earlier this year said, we're pulling the plug. Oh, so now it's because of the money. So I think the Indians' approach has been definitely better. Um, now let's see where they go with it. Now let's see what they come up with in terms of a name and how they rebrand. But I think they've handled it the right way. Now that there's plenty of people, including friends of mine, that say, oh my gosh, it's cancel culture, and this is too over the top, and Indians isn't a slur. What's next? You know, will the Kansas City Chiefs be forced to change their name, the Atlanta Braves? We'll see. Um, but Chippewas, because it's a tribe in central Michigan, that's been okay. Seminoles at Florida State has been okay uh, by the Seminole Nation. So uh, it's interesting. Yeah, in a lot of those cases, you do bring up a good point that that has been a conversation between those Native American tribes and those brands before they continued on with those brand names. For a, while, for, a, for a while there, it was looking like the Central Michigan Chippewas may have to change their name. The Florida State Sem Seminoles may have to change their name. But those conversations were had, those agreements were made, and it was cleared by both, by both parties involved in order to be able to continue on with that branding. And then uh, going back to the, to the current rebrand with the Cleveland Indians franchise, there's a year in between now and when they would be beginning their next, a year plus between now and when they would be beginning their first season under their new nickname. Do you imagine that this is going to be, would you presume that with the current ownership of this franchise, that this is going to be more of a, an internal rebrand? Or do you believe that they will heavily engage the Cleveland baseball team's f uh, fan base in, in the city of Cleveland, like we see when we have an expansion team come into a new league in many cases uh, in recent years and in the past? 
I don't know. That's a good question, Tyler. I, I'm not sure. Um, you know, like I said, the Dolans um, need to reach out to the fans um, a little bit better, um, and I think that that would that would certainly be this would be an opportunity to do that. The last time they changed and went to Indians, it was a contest in the in the old Cleveland Plain Dealer newspaper. So I don't know if they're going to go back to that again. Um, now, and <laughs> we all know. And Ronnie knows this. Social media it can get a little crazy, so you know, I think they'll reach out. I I I do believe they should, you know, uh, put it not not necessarily put it to a vote of the fans, but I definitely think that uh, things will leak out. Okay, there's already Cleveland Spiders logos. There's already things that have already started leaking out. Um, like I said, I'm not a fan of that. I I I would rather be Barons than Spiders, but we'll see where they go. We'll see where they go with it. Matt Derry with us, longtime Detroit sports radio host. You know him from his time uh, in 13 years at WDFN, 1130 AM, as well as on Detroit Sports 1051 from 2013 to 2016, and more recently on his Detroit Pistons Wired podcast and Locked on Lions daily podcast. So, Matt, bringing it back to local sports here in Detroit, it's not a great time to be a Detroit sports fan. None of the <laughs> local s- professional teams especially, and even to some extent on the college on the college side, especially on the Great Iron, it's been a tough several years here in the Detroit area. And that's certainly reflected it in, uh, in your old neck of the woods and Detroit sports radio. But there are a lot of things to be positive about in Detroit sports also, particularly with a lot of the young prospects that we have on our teams. And let's start off with the Detroit Pistons. Things have been looking a little bit brighter as we've gone into this preseason. Certainly this isn't going to be a team that's going to contend for a playoff spot. Uh, Definitely not going to be a contender even in a weaker Eastern Conference. But one of the many bright spots they have on their team are there are those young prospects that they have like Sekou Dumboya who's currently starting off with a great preseason currently averaging about 12 points per game just under a block uh, four rebounds he's had a couple of electric games against the New York Knicks and the Washington Wizards and then you have other young guys with a lot of promise like Killian Hayes who are learning from veteran players like Blake Griffin and Derrick Rose are things looking up for the Detroit Pistons even though they're still very early on in this re in this rebuild yeah i I think so i I really like what troy weaver the general manager has done uh he has come in and immediately cleaned house uh 80 percent of the roster turnover from a year ago some surprising moves both at uh you know when free agency started excuse me and also the draft and and i like that he's he's injected a little bit of energy in that building a lot of young players you mentioned seku you mentioned hayes Um, give them an opportunity, let them play. They're going to have their bumps in the road this year. They're going to lose some games. Um, They're only playing 72 as opposed to 82, but that's okay. If you're back in the lottery next year, so what? Uh, That organization, and I've worked for them for a long time, they they refused to hit the reset button for many years, going back to Joe Dumars, when some, including Mike Valeni, who I worked with at the ticket for years, was always begging for a rebuild. Now they have it. But... uh, they're sort of rebuilding, but with some pieces already in place before Troy got there. So I I am excited about what they're doing. I think it's, it's positive. You mentioned before about Detroit sports and um, it's, it's been rough. It's been rough. You know, the Tigers, uh, I I don't really know where they're going. I I know it's, they're younger, but I don't see them bypassing any of the four other teams in their division anytime soon. Uh, The lions are the lions. uh, Although now them starting over is a good thing. Certainly, uh, and I think a, good, a new GM and coach should revitalize some things. And I love the Chris Spielman move. Uh, and the Red Wings, again, you're right, in a weird spot too. But I think Steve Eiserman will get it done. I just think it's going to take longer. Yeah, the Pistons are, lo- are look really, looking really nice. And they're taking risks too, both at the front office level, bringing in some young guys with promise like a Josh Jackson, who just had a great game last night against the Washington Wizards, and taking risks on some guys that are – veterans of the league but still relatively young like a jeremy grant uh things are definitely looking up it's going to be several years for the detroit pistons on the other side the detroit lions fired their head coach matt patricia finally in the middle of the season interim coach daryl bevel takes over they also let go of bob quinn the general manager and now they're in a search for both the gm and and the coach it looks like currently 
they're looking for the GM first, a move that I certainly agree with. A lot of good candidates already out there, especially because they made this decision so early on. They've talked to guys like Lewis Riddick from ESPN. Most recently, they interviewed Scott Pioli, the ex-GM of, Bo of the Kansas City and a longtime executive scout uh, for the uh, New England Patriots. Right. In terms of the candidates that are currently out there on the GM side, who do you believe right now are some of those top-level candidates that the Lions should really be looking at among the guys that they have talked to already and maybe some that they haven't? Uh, well, you know, I, I talk about it every day on Locked on Lions on my podcast. Um, I think they're doing this right. Yes, I said it, the Detroit Lions are actually doing something right. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's a positive. Uh, I think at the very top, Sheila Ford, Hamp, and Rod Wood don't know anything about football. Plain and simple. But what I like is that this week they brought Chris Spielman in to help them, you know, to sort of guide the ship a little bit here when it comes to the interviews. I've been a Lewis Riddick fan going back to my radio days, days in 2015. I had him on my show a lot, and I wanted him, the Lions, to hire him before they hired Bob Quinn. So I've been on the Riddick bandwagon for five years. I like him a lot. I think he's sharp. He has experience in front offices. Do I think that that's who they're going to hire? I don't. I think they're going to probably go with somebody with experience. Uh, Rick Smith is would be a great candidate with the Tex, uh, formerly with the Texans. Only reason he left Houston was his wife was very ill, ended up passing away, and he stepped away from his position. He 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 drafted Sean Watson. I mean, the guy knows what he's doing. Uh, I think he would be a breath of fresh air. Look for a name like Ed Dodds. He's the assistant GM with the Colts. Their front office is structured beautifully. Uh, they can't interview him until after the season, but that would be another name that I would be very interested in seeing the Lions. Uh, kicking the tires on that's for sure. Yeah, his, his draft classes in, in Houston were fantastic, bringing in guys like Deshaun Watson, building that team that we're seeing now consistently uh, up until recent years be a very solid team, very consistent team yeah. that was right on the cusp of getting over the hump and being a Super Bowl contender. That would be a great pick. Uh, I also like the interview with Scott Pioli, although I'd rather see the Lions shy away from the Patriot way for a while. On the head coaching side, who are some of those candidates that you're looking at as this would fit this team as we currently have it right now, but also be able to mold into that next level, that next era of Lions football and maybe even turn things around? Um, you know, I, I really think the leader in the clubhouse is Robert Sala from Dearborn uh, and, and right here in Detroit, uh, the 49ers defensive coordinator. I think he's dying for this job. I think he wants this job. Um, he'd love to come home. He has family here. He has a big family out in San Francisco. And he's also very competent and a very good candidate. Uh, the 49ers defenses over the last years have been ferocious. This year they've lost a ton of guys, yet they still battle and compete. Uh, kind of ironic, uh, his name came up for the Lions job, and the next game he was on national TV and got smoked by the Rams, and it was kind of an ugly night, uh, which is sort of Lion-esque. Remember, Matt Patricia was getting the Lions job, and then in the Super Bowl, his defense couldn't stop uh, West Bloomfield High School. Actually, West Bloomfield's pretty good. Uh, Clarkston, name them, okay? Couldn't stop a high school team. And then Patricia, of course, failed miserably here. He was an embarrassment. So I think Sala will, would, would be the number one guy. I believe he'll get an interview for sure. Uh, offensively, watch for this, Tyler and, and, and Ronnie. I think if Doug Peterson gets fired in Philly, this is a Super Bowl winning coach. The Lions will talk to him, um, and there's a chance that happens. That I wouldn't rule out as far as another name for, for, for head coach. Brian Dayball, the offensive coordinator with the Bills, should get an interview. That offense is spectacular and very well run and very creative. So that's another name I think that would be out there. We are joined by Matt Derry, longtime Detroit sports radio host and Cleveland radio host here on 89.3 Lakes FM on Civic Center TV and 88.1 The Biff as well as Birmingham Area Municipal Access on the Oakland County Megacast. You can hear Matt on his podcast, the Detroit Pistons Wired podcast and Locked On Lions daily podcast, as well as a fill-in host on 92.3 The Fan FM in Cleveland. Matt, just a few more minutes with you before we let you go. On top of your sports gig, you're also in um, you're also in another another gig locally uh, with Financial Architects, where you started in 2019 as their communication and business development director. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you are doing there and how maybe that has some parallels to your previous work in the local area? No, I appreciate it. Um, 
it's been a, it's been a bit of a whirlwind for me. Like like we talked about in 2016 when I was uh, let go by the uh, then failing and now failed uh, Detroit Sports 105.1. Um, we've all been there. Uh, I, I I really sort of did a a, a pivot and decided to, to kind of get out of that business. There really was nothing for me here. Uh, like I said, I fill in, in in Cleveland, so I like I still have some radio that I can do. And um, but I worked three years at U of D high teaching, but and loved it. Absolutely love U of D Jesuit. Uh, but at Financial Architects, my wife and I have been clients since since 2010, 2011, um, and it's it's you know it's a firm that is uh, you know holistic and macroeconomic. We can take a look at everybody's whole picture and decide if it's a fit or not. And it's great people, and you want to be around an amazing culture and uh, working alongside people that you, that you enjoy being around, and that it's a healthy environment. And it was a no-brainer when they came to me and said, "Hey, listen." We need help with marketing and branding and we want to take next steps and they had some new ownership there and uh, that turned into me absolutely taking the job and i absolutely love it it's a great place um I've introduced a lot of, of people that i know uh to our advisors to hopefully help them out and um yeah th there are some parallels with <laughs> with radio a little bit they said to me we want to do a podcast can we do it and i said yeah and they're like well how long would that would that take and i said we can do it today I said, I, I got equipment in my basement. I got my microphone right here. I got my stuff here. So, uh, we, you know, we, we developed that and we do that. It's called the Empowering Futures Podcast Network and doing videos and stuff like you guys are doing here, uh, webinar shows. So I'm kind of uh, moving the brand forward. I have like the sports background, but still the broadcasting. And I brought it uh, to FAI and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Well, Matt, we appreciate having you on. Anything else that you would like to say or anything else you'd like to discuss before we let you go today? Well, I mean, listen, if we're if you're going to have me on, we haven't even brought up Ronnie's sweater today. Like, you know, Ronnie Dahl is a local legend. We all know that. And so the, the sweater, see, David, I can see David in queue. He's even smiling like this. That's top notch stuff. And the red underneath. Come on, Ronnie. Give well, yourself and some you, credit here. But you, you even missed it. See, Tyler got lucky because I had one for him. I just didn't get it to him in time. <laughs> It, it has cats and it lights up. Oh, it's come on. It's a glorious sweater. Oh, <laughs> See, that's big time. That's yes. big time. I feel, I feel underdressed and not wearing, you know, not participating. But uh, Same here. Next, time, next time you have me on, Lawrence, give me a heads up and I'll wear the, uh, I'll wear the sweater. But uh, awesome to see you guys and I, I appreciate you having me on. Well, happy holidays to you and your family. You too, Ronnie. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tyler. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break on the Megacast Holiday Special. Be right back. I choose. I choose. I choose. I choose. I choose to stay above the influence for my education. For my sports and my family. For football. To protect my future. To pursue my dream of becoming a lawyer. Because cheer is important to me. I stay above the influence because I can focus better in school and make a positive impact on the world. For my family and as well my passion in photography. So I can keep my focuses on my dream to be a great leader and focus on my archery. Because I want to have a strong mind and a strong body. To protect my future. To stay healthy and to stay safe. I stay above the influence to continue to pursue what I love. Because I'm an athlete and I don't want to damage my body. To spread positivity through my peers and to be a positive leader in my community. To focus on my extracurricular activities. Because as an advocate for You Matter at my high school, I believe in relying on a support system of friends and loved ones rather than turning to substance abuse. Because I want to be the best I can be for those I love. For my family and for my health. I'm a butter influence because of books and this ball. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. 
More Megacast coming up on 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills and 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake. If you're as bad of a driver as I am, you probably don't want to be getting behind a wheel for nearly four hours to drive up north. Well, good news. You might not have to for long. Jerry Bruckbauer from Michigan Groundwork Transportation Center checked in with us recently to talk about the development of a railway from Ann Arbor to Traverse City. Our first guest with us today on this show is the Deputy Director for Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities, Jim Bruckbauer. But Jim, I'm so excited because the thought you really are the person behind trying to push for us to get a, a railway system from Ann Arbor up to Traverse City and the cities along the way. We, it, this has been uh, in the making for years though. What is the possibility of this actually uh, taking shape? Well, the, uh, the possibility is quite high. We are uh, you know, working to advance this project and bring it forward to, to its next steps. It's a, it's a big idea, that's for sure. And yeah, it has been talked about for years. Uh, several years ago, the state was creating a plan for both freight and passenger rail. And one of the things that the uh, Michigan Department of Transportation did was when it was creating a state rail plan, they had worked with groups around the state to hold forums and get feedback from uh, places all over the, all over the state and, and people in those forums and in those surveys said, hey, if we're going to invest in rail, we want a, a train connection to Traverse City. And so it, it came up as one of the top priorities in this, this public input session all around the state. And so, so it's, a, a lot of people are interested in it. It's a, it's a unique opportunity too, because the state still owns a, a majority of the right of way and the tracks that are, that are still in place right now that do connect uh, the Ann Arbor area to Traverse City. And, and they're also in, in good shape still. So, so we see this as, a, as an opportunity that we want to continue to explore. Right now they're, they're being used for freight traffic. So, so goods are being shipped from Northern Michigan to places all over the country. And we just wanna see a little bit more uh, passenger service along the same tracks. So, when you hear about this, uh, you know, when you, you're just a regular person such as myself, I will say I have, as a former news reporter, I have covered so many of these press conferences where they would bring out like the shiny boards with the plan and this, that, and the other. But from the press conference to actually seeing reality, I have yet to see any of these projects come to fruition. So with that, what will it take to actually make this happen. Yeah, so it is, uh, you know, big transportation projects like this do take some time and, and we are an advocacy organization. So we certainly uh, relate to getting impatient with uh, the, the pace of change, but a, a big idea like this does take time. Like I said, this is a unique opportunity because the state owns the majority of the right of way and so when you're talking about big infrastructure and transportation projects like this, that part of the process is, is already taken care of. A, a lot of places around the country, um, the railroad tracks are, are privately owned or have even been taken out. And the, this is the unique opportunity with, with this particular idea because we do, the, the state still owns the right of way for the, for the most part and the infrastructure is still there. So we're just looking at what improvements need to be made in order to start uh, putting passengers on trains on a regular basis. Right now, there are excursion trains that um, are operating along the, the corridor. Uh, there's a group in Owasso called the Steam Railroading Institute. And, and over the past decades, they've put together these fall color tour trains up in the Northern Michigan area and also um, downstate, um, in the Owasso area, but then also traveling between Mount Pleasant and Cadillac. They've put together summer, summer trains. So there are some kind of tourist type trains, but what we're interested in is looking at the 
um, regular passenger service. And, and we do want to start small and build the service incrementally. And one of the first steps that um, happened over the past couple of years is we were able to put together an initial study on what it would take to get trains going certain speeds and, and how many people might, might ride it. What had happened after that is that the state is continuing to invest in the tracks for both the freight and the passenger side. So in particular, in the Traverse City area, repairs were made to the tracks that would allow passengers to travel directly into, into Traverse City and, and repairs are going to continue to be made over the next year. So, so we're getting some of that analysis done and we are seeing the, the state invest in the tracks, again, for both the freight and the, and the passenger side. So, so we are hitting some, some key milestones and we're, we're just excited to, to launch this project into its next phases. I'm looking at this and there are so many benefits and even economic benefits as well. But before we uh, get into that conversation, we're also in the middle of a pandemic and the focus right now is definitely not on a, you know, rail transportation from Ann Arbor to the northern part of the state. How has that impacted the work that you and your team are doing? Sure. Well, the, the pandemic has, has certainly slowed down our ability to put together potential train rides, even with just getting like a, you know, a small group of people on it just to look at the tracks and see what we're, what's needed next. And, but overall, the project is still moving ahead. We are looking at when we can start to put train rides together. And a lot of it is going to, yeah, depend on the pandemic and, and some of the safety uh, standards that we want to put in place. Uh, so it has slowed our ability to actually put people on trains. Uh, however, uh, again, we are still moving ahead with some of those track repairs and, and also just getting those, those next steps needed as far as analysis for, for putting the whole thing together. I mean, we have to figure out, you know, what kind of operating structure the project like this needs. Should it be a nonprofit, a for-profit? So, so this gives us a little time to put some of those pieces in place. Uh, but overall, the, the project is still still moving ahead. That's for sure. So as you mentioned, you're an advocacy group. So why did you get involved in this? So we are, again, a nonprofit advocacy organization. We're based right here in Traverse City. And we work primarily in areas of local food, clean energy, and, and transportation policy. For 20 years, we were known as the Michigan Land Use Institute. So many people still know us by that name and, and recognize that name. Um, and, and we advance policies that are regional and statewide that will help people gain access to, again, more locally grown food, cleaner sources of energy. But then in our transportation work, we're, we're trying to help people get around by using lots of different transportation options other than just the car. So, uh, you know, when, when a project, when an opportunity like this comes up, again, um, you know, a project that the, the infrastructure is still there, the state still owns most of the corridor. This is a downtown to downtown connection that will connect not only people who are traveling around the state, but college students, you know, we, we thought, hey, this is an opportunity that we need to at least explore and move forward. And, and so far, uh, it's been it's been working out well. I mean, it, it's just a it's an idea that has a lot of public support, uh, including from the, the business community, uh, the you know, people who are trying to attract talent to to Michigan because this project, you know, not only is about just like the freight and passenger mobility connections throughout Michigan, but it's about connecting students, universities, and people who, you know, workers who just want to get around uh, the state without jumping in a car every time they want to want to get around. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a big idea, and, and it's something that you know these are just opportunities that our organization continues to explore. Not only are we trying to get the policies in place, but we're trying to put together on the ground projects. Yeah, I could imagine, especially if I'm a parent, 
so many kids that go like uh, to Central or some of those other universities, they, um, you know, students can't have a car typically their first year or two. So parents are making that trip up and back. So if I could put them on the train and even if it's not coming to my doorstep, I only have to go to Ann Arbor. That's an easier trip to pick them up than going all the way up to Mount Pleasant. Uh, but with that too, do you feel like this could help in trying to attract people to move to the state of Michigan? Because one thing that you do know and you see when you go to other cities such as Chicago, you don't need a car to get around. Uh, there are a lot of people that you know live in various cities across the country and you can live without a car but here in the Metro Detroit and within the state of Michigan, because we are the auto capital of the world, it's nearly impossible. That's correct. I mean, this, we, a lot of people talk about this stretch. It's about a 240 mile stretch. It's a distance that's almost too far to drive, but too close to fly. So it's actually that sweet spot, the, the transit people call it for, for a, a rail line like this. And yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea just crosses many generations. I mean, think of the, the baby boomers who, you know, are getting into decades where they're not just so eager to jump in a car to, to travel from, you know, downstate to the Northern Michigan area and, and between. And, you know, think about just the, the families and again, the students, uh, there are many different universities along this line because it connects up again from Ann Arbor up to Mount Pleasant and then over to Cadillac and then up to, to Traverse City. So um, it's, it's definitely a, a university connector. And then, yeah, that, that next generation worker who, who wants to, to be in Michigan and not necessarily have a, have a car to um, always, always get around the state. When we visited some of the uh, tech businesses down in Ann Arbor, and uh, when we talked to them about this idea, you know, one, we were at one company, and and one of the uh, employees came up to us and said, "Hey, I love this idea. I just moved here from Michigan to or from uh, Boulder, Colorado, to to work here at this this company, and I didn't have a driver's license because I didn't need one where where I lived before. And then when I moved here, I needed to get a driver's license and you know, he thought it was so annoying. And so he said, yeah, you know, I just want the ability to, to get around the state and not have to always jump in a car. So. Right. And on top of that, uh, for, you know, some of the younger people too, the car is such an added expense as well. So I would imagine if I'm, you know, looking at jobs across the country and, you know, that could factor into which job I decide to go with. That's correct. And, and again, we're, Michigan is in a, what I would consider a mobility revolution with all the efforts of the Michigan Economic Development Corp and, and the state's just mobility priorities. This is just an addition to a lot of these mobility connections that we're already making within cities. I mean, you're seeing advancements in autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, and just a whole you know, plethora of ways that people will be able to start getting around within cities. And this is that kind of downtown to downtown, city to city connector. Have you talked to uh, some of the uh, like mayors and elected leaders in some of these smaller towns? Because if you can get a train that stops directly downtown and a tiny little town, it has to be a, the possibility of an economic boom for their community. That's that's correct. I mean, there, we see the interest from from all these towns that that this train line would potentially run through. The um, you know, it, like I said, it is a downtown to downtown connector. So the people in these communities are are seeing this as a way to be able to connect to Southeast Michigan, where they might be going uh, for traveling for a number of different reasons. But, you know, not only is it this, this Ann Arbor to Traverse City thing, but it is for these, these towns, these mid-Michigan downtowns that I think are some of the best downtowns in the entire country uh, because of their buildings and, and the rivers that go through them. These are some historic downtowns that I think are, are some of the envy of the, of the rest of the country. And this would allow families in these communities to be able to jump on a train and, 
and have access to major metro areas and just be able to get around uh, the whole state. Jim Bruckbauer with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. He's the Deputy Director for Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities. And we are talking about the plan to build the Ann Arbor to Traverse City train. And uh, so what's next for this, um, this project, Jim? So we are excited to, to launch this into its next phases. We, number one, need to complete the uh, next formal studies that need to be completed in order for there to be fast moving regular service along this line. So there are environmental and engineering studies that, that need to take place. Again, we need to explore the operating structure for, for how passenger trains could run uh, along this line. So we need to know, should this be a nonprofit or a for-profit? We are in the process of exploring those different operating structures. And then again, hopefully we'll begin running tests along the, the train line itself. We, wanna, we do wanna get people in a train and be able to look at, okay, you know, how long is it gonna take to travel in between these towns? And, and what are we looking at? What type of investment do we need to, to get this into its next phases? And then over time, start to put together more train rides and kind of build the service incrementally. We want to start with potentially seasonal type trains and then just build more regular service as we go along. At the end of the day, this is about money. Where is the money coming from and how much money do you anticipate this project needing to get it completed? Sure, and that's a, that's a great question. We. Uh, our organization is, is privately funded, so we're a, we're a private nonprofit, and we almost we get almost 100% of our funding through private foundation grants and, and individual donors, and so the the funding that's gone into this this work so far has been from our organization, privately funded, and we are looking at you know what type of structure is needed for both the investment in the infrastructure but also into the the capital and the operations and that's why i say we're looking into just different nonprofit structures or for-profit structures because you're seeing a lot of for-profit investment in rail around the country more recently uh, in, in florida and texas and the Las Vegas, Los Angeles area. So there is a lot of private investment right now that is going into a passenger rail service. And so we are just looking at all the different opportunities that are out there. We don't see this as a, as a publicly funded project. We are looking at uh, certainly the, the private sector sources that can go into uh, a project like this. So if it, COVID has taught us anything, it's about being creative and we are seeing more collaboration between a public private possibility of you know coming together to make something like this happen could that be something to be explored that is uh, absolutely being explored and, and that's why the potential for a nonprofit structure could make sense for something like this where there there may be some public investment again in the state's own infrastructure that that they are maintaining and then there could be private investment that goes into the actual capital and operations for, for running a train. And then that, so that's, those are some of the things that, that we are exploring. We're looking at some of the costs and looking at all the different funding sources. Uh, but again, you know, we, we do need to get creative. We, we don't see this as a major you know, publicly funded infrastructure project. This is a something where you there are models out there where there's private investment that, that goes into a, a project like this. I love the idea of this. I think it would definitely be utilized on so many different avenues. Uh, Jim Bruckbauer with us here. Uh, just another minute or two, we're talking about the Ann Arbor to Traverse City train and the possibility of that uh, actually becoming a reality one day. And with that, Jim, if people are interested in trying to find out a little bit more about what uh, your organization is about, but also about this project, uh, where can they get that information? So you can find our website at groundworkcenter.org and that's for uh, the Groundwork Center, which is the nonprofit that's really moving this, this project along. You can just Google Groundwork Center as well and it should pop up. 
we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, which is just incredible. Uh, so you can find more about our organization through that site. You can find out more about the train project through a2tc.org, or I'm sure many of your listeners will, will probably Google Ann Arbor to Traverse City train. Yeah, that's a, that's a simple way to find it as well. So uh, we try to update people as, as much as possible. We're trying to get into the communities and, and making sure people are up to date and have opportunities for providing input into into this this project as well that's that's one of our goals just to make sure you know it's not just us just moving this thing along we want to make sure that we're hearing from from people in all these communities so they can they can help shape this idea well i'm down for this i will tell you that uh but uh with that you have a big a big job ahead of you, uh, because in the middle of this, again, we're, we're in a pandemic. So trying to talk about this, it has to be a little bit difficult during this time, but it is an important project that can definitely reshape uh, our, you know, our economy in some of these towns as well. So I love it. And I hope that uh, we see it come to a reality one day. Jim, thank you again. So uh, for taking time out of your day to be with us. And thank you very much for having me. It's easy to go pick out a Christmas tree and set it up in your living room. But have you ever thought about the process that goes into getting this tree from the planting to your house? Just wait and see what Amy Starr from the Michigan Christmas Tree Association had to say to Ronnie and Tyler about this process. One thing everyone seems to want this year is a lot of holiday cheer and it begins with the perfect Christmas tree. Joining us now on the Oakland County Mega Cast is Amy Stark. She's the executive director for the Michigan Christmas Tree Association. Amy, thank you for being with us. Well, thanks for having me. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to you and your team as well. Uh, just to start off, it seems like it's been a great year for the Christmas tree farmers. You know, it really has. You know, going into this situation back in March, April, we were really nervous about, you know, what's going to happen down the road? You know, we have a very short selling week season, you know, it's only a couple of weeks and we were kind of concerned, but then we were able to see some of the other commodities coming ahead of us, you know, like pumpkins and apples and they had booming seasons as well. And so we knew we better be prepared. And so our growers got together, came up with some best practices to keep everybody safe and have, be ready for our customers to come. For us that aren't farmers at all, <laughs> but can you talk a little bit about the process that it takes to actually get a tree from the seedling all the way to um, a, a Christmas tree lot? Well, it takes about 10 to 12 years from seedling, but the tree actually is transplanted a couple times before it's found its forever home in a Christmas tree field. And so from that point, it's about eight to 10 years. And you know, a lot of people now have these really tall ceilings and they want these really big trees and those take even longer. So, and during that time, you know, the growers have fertilized it and treated it for different things to be sure that, you know, it doesn't have any pests or problems with it through the years, through the growing years to make sure that it is a beautiful Christmas tree eight to 10 years later. But it's got to be hard to try to navigate the market from year to year because you don't know what it's going to bring. Like this year seems to be so popular because of the pandemic. And obviously no one predicted that eight years ago. So how do farmers adjust in the middle of these cycles of need and not need? Well, that's been kind of tough because we are kind of going into a time period where there has been a reduction in planting back in 2008, 2009, when the recession hit, we're kind of seeing those effects now. So there isn't as many trees as there were 10 years ago, let's say. And so you can't speed this process up. It is kind of what it is. Um, a lot of people will go out to a farm and say, well, why are they closed? You know, they still have trees, I can see them. But if they sell out everything they have, then they don't have anything for the following year. So they kind of have to decide, is this it? This is it. So I can be open next year for my customers. Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest things that people don't uh, understand. I know that we had a tree farmer from up north that came down and set up the lot here uh, in our neighborhood and he sold out pretty quickly. But 
Can you talk a little bit about the, the process and the sacrifice that some of these tree farmers go through to grow their product up north, but then to bring them down into the populated areas to sell them? Oh yeah, there's, it's a whole logistics situation of, you know, they have to harvest, um, you know, in November, so you have to make sure that, you know, you keep them in an area to stay cool and protected. And then you have to, you know, get together with some trucking companies to bring them down into those areas. It's a, it's a lot of work, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, oh, Christmas trees, you know, they're, they're, you know, you put them in the ground and couple years later you cut them and that's that and there's a lot more to this and there's a lot of science to it as well you know the growers have to know when they treat for certain things when they trim when they um, shear their trees all that is a process and each type of tree is different so you can't shear a scotch pine when you were going to shear maybe a con color so they're just a little different and it's amazing the stuff that you know they know to make these beautiful christmas trees how has technology played a part in the industry? Well, it's interesting because there's some now um, heavy duty kind of um, tractors that will um, spray and trim at the same time um, and do multiple rows, you know, so it's not just one push mower going through and mowing, you know, some of that is on a small farm, but like a big um, wholesale farm maybe has, you know, thousands of acres. So they have big industrial tractors that have been designed specifically for Christmas trees. So when it comes to the Christmas tree industry, what does this really mean for Michigan's overall economics and, and the impact that it has on the state? It's about 35 million uh, to Michigan's economy. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, like again, Christmas trees, you know, my little local farmer down the road. And there's a lot of that. There's about 500 Christmas tree farms in Michigan, but we have a large wholesale market. We're third in the United States in Christmas tree production. So lots of trees, over 2 million sold out of Michigan every year. So it's not just here, but it's also across, do they mainly like the Midwest region? Oh, all over the place. I mean, you might be celebrating Christmas in Texas with a Michigan grown Christmas tree or down in Florida, yeah, they're all over. So if someone is interested in, in the business side of this, because it really is fascinating, we don't think about it, especially when we live down in the Metro Detroit area, how can they explore more about the opportunities to try to get into this business? Well, what they should do is obviously contact the Michigan Christmas Tree Association, and then we'll connect you with um, Michigan State is one of our educational partners. There's a lot of resources on the Michigan State Extension website about growing Christmas trees. Um, and especially just getting in touch with the association to, to find a good, uh, reliable nursery source, because that's your first step is grow, starting, you know, with a small seedling. But, you know, you can't just choose any seedling and say, I want to grow this, because it depends on the site to soil, you know, what you can grow and where. So, you know, they're in, you have to also be committed to that eight to 10 year process before you get a return on your investment. So a lot of people get excited saying, oh, yay, you know, Christmas trees are selling out. I want to get into that business. You have to understand that it's going to take time before you get your money back. That so, is a yeah. long time, but you have to be patient. Amy Start with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. She's the executive director for the Michigan Michigan Christmas Tree Association. And with that, Amy, uh, when we talk about the different kinds of trees, I know that most people by now have their tree up, but there are still some people um, trying to, you know, it's, it's maybe their holiday tradition that they don't put it up until Christmas Eve. So for the few people out there who still want that live Christmas tree, what should they look for? Well, you want to make sure it's fresh. So if you're getting one from a lot, um, take and pull a few needles off, you know, kind of run your hands down a branch. And if it seems like you're losing a lot of needles, choose a different tree. Um, if you're going to a choose and cut farm, there's still a few that are open. Some people stay open up until Christmas Eve because of those traditions. Um, you'll, you know you'll get a fresh tree then. And then the most important thing is to make sure that you water your tree. You know, at first that tree takes a lot of water. So when you get it home, be sure to water it. And don't just put it in your garage 
and leave it for a day or two because the sap will kind of make a little barrier for the water to go up through the, the stump part. So be sure to get it in some water right away and water it often. And, and then we, keep it yeah, away we, from the heat source. Yeah, and we hear, um, should you ask if you go to a tree farm or a, a tree lot for them to cut the bottom portion for you right there in front of you? Yes, I would. I'd ask them to take a couple inches off the bottom. And that way, unless you know you're good at with the saw yourself at home or your husband was or something. But for me, I always say, hey, can you cut it for me? And, and a lot of them will do a, like a drill in the bottom so it'll stay in a pin stand and stuff and you know, stay straight for you when you put it up. Yeah, no, we don't need any uh, injuries. Have the professionals <laughs> do that. And, and with that, though, how do you know if a tree is fresh? Should you ask when were these trees cut? Because what is that timeline typically like? Well, it can be, you know, early November when the tree is cut. Uh, but, you know, the trees are kept in a way that will stay fresh for that time period. It's just and once you make that fresh cut, it'll start absorbing and kind of almost act as if it's, you know, coming alive again. It'll take the water and it'll kind of bounce back. So that's important. Um, but the most important thing, you know, most of them, uh, of course, everybody's going to say my trees are fresh, of course, and they are, but just kind of feel them and look at them. But you should, you should know if it seems fresh. You know, so you know, what is the timeline? Um, is it like a week or two weeks or three weeks? When we say fresh, what is that timeline from cutting to buying? What is the perfect time? Well, you know, it varies and it varies based on the type of tree too. You know, you don't want to get a tree, let's say um, maybe a Douglas fir and have it, you know, cut for a long time because they stay, they don't hold their needles as well if it's been a long time period. But, you know, like I said, it depends on the type of tree and what you're getting, you know, and where, where the tree is. We've had really good weather this year for Christmas trees to be outside and to kind of stay in that like refrigerated kind of climate. Um, when it stays, when it goes real hot and then real cold, that's kind of tough on the trees too. And we've had a lot of overcast days and that helps too. So the sun's not baking on them. Is there an option for people who love getting a real Christmas tree and the smell that it brings to their home, but they feel bad about using a tree that's cut down and then is, you know, just disposed of on the curb once the holiday is over. Can you buy a tree that you can plant or is there a way to recycle these as well? Oh, well, a couple things there. One, keep in mind these trees are grown for the purpose of harvesting, just like corn or pumpkins or anything like that. That's the grower's livelihood. So you're supporting farming, Michigan farming, by buying a real Christmas tree. So don't feel bad about doing it. They, they're planting one to two more right in the spot for that tree that has been taken out. But there also is what's called a living tree, which is kind of a root. It has the root system in it and you can plant it outside. Some people opt to do something like that. And that way they don't feel like they're killing a tree. Although the trees that are disposed of after the holidays are usually chipped up and used in mulch in city parks. They are, they're recycled. And that's the thing with Christmas trees. It's a renewable and recyclable resource for Michigan because we do use the, those disposed trees for other things. So, you know, a lot of cities will chip them and then put them through their parks. Or um, you can also put it in your yard after the after you take it down in your house and you can decorate it in your yard and see, you know, the birds perching on it and then, you know, dispose of it. So I have noticed over the past few years, it seems like the farmers are starting to realize the trends and using the leftover portions of the tree for decorating and building like these beautiful pots for your front porch or for garland and this, that, and the other. Cause it used to be, you could go to a lot and be like, Hey, can I get your tree trimmings? And they'd be like, Oh yeah, here. Now they're like, okay, that will be 25 bucks. So it, 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 they're, it's evolving, right? Yeah. You know, they are doing some beautiful stuff, you know, like at garland and um, tabletop decorations and, you know, the wreaths and things like that. You can, a lot of farms will give you whatever they trim off. Like when you take your tree over and say, hey, I want um, so much 
uh, room underneath for my presence. Can you remove these branches? A lot of them will give you those branches. Um, but they will sell bundles of those because so many people are doing the porch pots and things like that. But yeah, you know, I hope that that's another part of Michigan's economy um, too that the growers bring is in those products that they're selling. So if somebody says, you know, I don't do a real Christmas tree, you know, consider going out to those farms and buying the other things that can add to the scent in your home and that type of thing and kind of give it that real Christmas feel in your home. Yeah, I will say that's one of the things I do because uh, you talk to a lot of firefighters and real Christmas trees for them are like a devastation because they can they can cause fires when people don't properly care for them. But um, I'm, I'm just lazy now as I get older and I get the, the fake tree because I find needles like in June and July. I'm like, I thought I cleaned all these up, but I get the garland and all of the branches and make my own tree pots and things of that nature. So at least my house still has the smell and the look of Christmas. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I pick up all the needles, too, and I always think, oh, nature's confetti. <laughs> You know, it's just part of what it is, but it does. It just gives you that, you know, it, that smell and the aroma. And, you know, for me, it's the bringing my kids up to the farm and seeing all the people getting excited. And it just really puts me in the spirit to go get that real tree or, you know, buy the wreaths and all the stuff. So we're in the middle of a pandemic. How has it changed how Michigan's tree farmers try to reach the public? Are they utilizing social media now more than ever to try to share the story behind the process of, of actually, you know, growing a Christmas tree? You know, yes. And it's, it's kind of interesting because we have kind of a different uh, situation with our growers. Some are like very much off the grid, you know, they just, they don't do the internet, you know, I try to email them and they're like, you know, I don't do email or something. And then you have some that are really into the whole social media aspect of it. You know, some young growers have really come up with creative things. But, you know, in Michigan, we have what's called the Christmas, well, in the United States, actually, the Christmas Tree Promotion Board. And it's kind of like the beef what's for dinner or the avocados from Mexico. It promotes Christmas trees and that throughout the U.S. And basically, they help do a lot of promotion. Um, they do a lot of social media stuff and to encourage people to go out to get real Christmas trees. And then social media, like I said, some of the growers are just fantastic about, you know, getting their product, their ideas out and their, their hours, the, you know, their business plans and stuff like that out. So people know, hey, this grower is, they're open and they're doing best practices for COVID. So let's go, let's go visit them this year. With that though, it's like their window of opportunity to sell seems so small oh, it's what like, do they do like the other 11 months out of the year well you know i thought when i got into this business several years ago hey this is going to be the best job in the world i'm going to work for like a month right no no it's a lot more than that uh, there's a lot of education that goes into um growing christmas trees so they do a lot of in the off season they uh, do a lot of classes um they do a lot of trimming of their trees uh, like I said, fertilizing, scouting, you know, there's different things you have to make sure that, you know, your trees don't get in like a needle cast, um, things like that, because that's your investment. So you have to be on your trees, looking them over all the time, making sure that nothing's happening to them. Uh, so that, that takes a lot of time, you know, and then in the off time, they also have to, you know, sharpen all their equipment and, uh, you know, they have mowers that they are kind of tweaking all the time and making sure that those are running appropriately. And then, you know, in the decorating portion of when you go to a Christmas tree farm, you see it's all decorated. That takes a lot of time, too, to prepare for the customer. So there's always something to do. So when you're looking at it, really, though, their business model is that month a, it is really setting the stage for the rest of the year in their business. Their profit is about that one month. Oh, yes, absolutely. And it starts that weekend after Thanksgiving, and it's that week, and then there's probably about two more weeks, and then it's, you know, kind of most people by then, by the 10th, usually most people have their Christmas tree. But, yeah, it's it's a quick season. You have to be ready. Oh my gosh. I, you know, I was amazed um, 
uh, last year I remember meeting the people in Eastern Market here in Detroit. They were from up north and they bring a camper down and they live down in the metro Detroit area in their camper until their season is over. And I don't think people really understand the sacrifice that really goes into that one Christmas tree. Oh, it, it, like I said, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It's years. It's a year, you know, many, many years of investment. And it's, but it's such a wonderful thing because it just does bring so much joy to people. And, you know, they're so happy, you know, to be able to produce this product that people can, it's the centerpiece of people's homes for the holidays. It really is. It's the backdrop of our memories. So uh, with that, uh, Amy, before we let you go, uh, just another question or two. And I wonder about um, employees. What's it been like for them to get employees to go into this industry? Because I would think that a lot of these are kind of family traditions where it was a grandfather to the father to the son is that interest still there with the younger generation? And are these tree farmers struggling for people to take up this legacy? You know, yes, they are. Um, It's interesting that there's several growers that it's been the generational farm and then the the son goes away and says, "Ah, I don't want anything to do with it. They spend a little time out in corporate America. You know, they maybe got a degree from you know state or something, then goes get a job working at a desk. And pretty soon they're back. They're back in the business again because they're like, I really liked this better working for myself. Um, so, you know, you see that, but then you also see, um, you know, if they don't have children, you know, that's been an issue, you know, or maybe they have girls and the girls don't want anything to do with it. And then the you know, son-in-laws don't. So that that kind of has been a, a problem, but also just getting help and getting help this year has been super hard because, uh, you know, a lot of times they employ, you know, local teens, things like that. And just getting people to want to work during COVID has not been that easy. So that's been tough. When do they actually start harvesting the trees? Is it mid-November? Uh, no, it's early November. Early November. So, um, I, cause you would wonder maybe too, if it would help because so many of the students were, you know, remote learning <laughs> per se, you know, so they could go out there and get jobs and, and help out and carry a legacy. Yeah, and you know what, the most help that a lot of people need too is, you know, like at a choose and cut farm, you know, just that um, customer, moving customers, you know, the filling the hot chocolates, things like that, you know, the smaller jobs, kind of just making sure that the flow, especially during COVID that, you know, there was an in and there's an out and people are separated and all that, which is great at a Christmas tree farm because we got lots of acreage anyways for that separation. But, you know, that's where you need so many more people and in farms, you know, they not only have their staff and a lot of times that's their family, um, but then they also hire locals and stuff to help them. And this year it's just been really challenging. Well, the good thing though, is it seems like a lot of our Christmas tree farmers are going to have a very Merry Christmas because sales have been up and the tree lots are now empty. Uh, Our local guy pulled out last week Uh, ahead of schedule because he was out of product and so we're wishing them a very merry Christmas because they do so much to bring us that real Christmas tree experience. Yes and you know they're so happy they get to have a Christmas too because there's been many years where they are right up till the 23rd 24th trying to sell those trees because once they're cut that's it you know so they're happy this year. It's been a great, great year for them. Well, that is good to know. We need a little bit of a silver lining in the middle of this pandemic. Amy, i start with us. She's the executive director for the Michigan Christmas Tree Association. Amy, before I let you go, anything maybe I didn't mention that you want to touch on? Uh, just, you know, know that if you do still need to go to a Christmas tree farm, go to our website, which is mcta.org. And there's a list of choose and cut farms on there and also retail lots. So you can find out if the farm is still open. You could call ahead. That way you don't make a trip and find out that they're not open. And just know that the farms are incorporating best practices to keep you safe. So go take your family, It's take your camera. It's a great spot to take some beautiful pictures. And right now, I mean, 
we don't really have much to take pictures of all at our home. So this is a great opportunity for you. So, you know, enjoy that. And um, again, we're just so thankful that the community came out and supported our industry. And, you know, we wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Well, we say the same to you and all of the farmers out there as well. Happy holidays and thank you for what you do to bring these memories into our homes. Thank you. Have a great day. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break on the Megacast Holiday Special. Be right back. I choose. I choose. I choose. I choose. I choose to stay above the influence for my education. For my sports and my family. For football. To protect my future. To pursue my dream of becoming a lawyer. Because cheer is important to me. I stay above the influence because I can focus better in school and make a positive impact on the world for my family and as well my passion in photography. So I can keep my focuses on my dream. To be a great leader and focus on my archery. Because I want to have a strong mind and a strong body. To protect my future. To stay healthy and to stay safe. I stay above the influence to continue to pursue what I love. Because I'm an athlete and I don't want to damage my body. To spread positivity through my peers and to be a positive leader in my community. To focus on my extracurricular activities. Because as an advocate for You Matter at my high school, I believe in relying on a support system of friends and loved ones rather than turning to substance abuse. Because I want to be the best I can be for those I love. For my family and for my health. I'm a butter influence because of books and this ball. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. No matter how well-mannered you are, we can always use a little refresher on some basic adequate skills especially as we're about to sit down at the table for Christmas dinner. Stacy Amy, the etiquette guru, checked in with Ronnie and Tyler on the Megacast to get us ready for our 2020 holiday season. Our celebrations are now changing due to COVID-19. So, so many things for family and friends to navigate in the middle of this crisis. And joining us now on the Oakland County Megacast, we're happy to welcome back Stacy Amy. She's the etiquette guru here on the Megacast. Thank you for being with us again. Good morning. So this is going to be a Christmas like Christmases that we have not had before. And while the warning is out there, the officials, the CDC, the health officials are telling us not to gather. What do you think is going to happen um, this year? What about family members that some are going to go ahead and ignore those rules and those regulations and get together? How do you bow out if you're not comfortable going to a family celebration? I think the biggest thing is to realize that holidays can be stressful under normal conditions. So keep in mind that it's okay to miss a year if you're keeping the big picture in mind, which is to be able to celebrate with everyone for more years to come. Um, definitely skipping if you're not feeling well, but if you are going to socialize, you'll want to practice the big three that everyone keeps saying. So distancing, mask wearing, and frequent hand washing. So everyone's doing Zoom right now. Is there Zoom etiquette out there, rules there that is. we should be following? There is, and that's actually, I was going to say, that's a nice suggestion. Um, obviously, the most protective thing we can do this year is to try to participate in holiday alternatives. So people are doing family Zoom calls, um, gathering outside, weather permitting, and I've heard of people planning distanced garage parties. Um, but if you are on Zoom, you just want to try to treat it like you are in person, 
preparing in advance if it's a more formal situation, uh, being in a quiet spot with minimal background noises, no eating, drinking, or smoking. Um, you're really on display when you're only showing your face. So the littlest thing is quite distracting. But if you are with your family or even, I want to make this point too, if you are in a business situation, don't sweat the small stuff. Uh, you are at home. So if a kid runs by or a baby cries, the dog barks, no big deal. Um, so don't worry about that, but try your best, but enjoy your family. And there's a little more um, relaxation that can go on, I think, if you're having one of those family Zoom celebrations. And with that, um, the family Zoom celebrations, it, like it, when you bring people together and some know technology, others don't know technology, uh, there could be a little bit of frustration going on there and boiling up as well. Any advice to people trying to do some of these family uh, virtual meetings? Yeah, just relax and be patient with people, enjoy them. This whole experience has been tremendously stressful for people. So just continue to be respectful of everybody and whatever you're deciding is right for you and your family. Uh, know that everyone has different opinions, fears, concerns going on this year. People are still at opposite ends of the spectrum. So for safety's sake, if if you are in person and you're a mask believer, give the non-mask wearers their space. Um, it just the thing about etiquette is about being well-mannered is making others feel comfortable. And so whatever you can do to um, accomplish that, if you, if you are hosting a gathering, communicate your wishes to your guests beforehand so there's no uncomfortable misunderstandings. If you are, um, going to be a guest then see you seek out your host and ask them what their expectations are and of course for any celebration whether you're at home or in person uh, the basics haven't changed so dress up be on time and have nice positive conversations one thing we are seeing not only a change in our holiday family celebrations but also the office work party many of them have gone virtual what should people be doing? Because this is going to be a big week, I think, for a lot of these um, work parties. For work parties, you definitely want to mind yourself. Um, I always suggest don't get drunk. Uh, you want to still maintain your poise there. And again, with what you're doing on camera, um, be mindful of it. So not smoking. And again, you don't want to present yourself in an, you know, just don't get drunk. <laughs> all I can say. <laughs> Being virtual, there are still some rules to be playing along with that. And I will say too, I, I think sometimes people get so comfortable, they forget to look at what's in their background mm -hmm. of their Zoom calls. Yes, I agree. Just really try to prepare be beforehand and pay attention to what others will be seeing. And if you can look at your own uh, reflection in your Zoom meeting, and that will give you a heads up as to things you want to eliminate behind you. So we've been talking about this for several months now, but it's still a topic I think that needs to be covered when it comes to our mask. What is the etiquette around mask wearing? And if we see someone in public, should we say something or just turn away? Uh, my feeling on that is it's not your place to school someone on that. People have, we've been going through this, like you said, for many months. They know the right way to wear them. Um, I guess it, it bears repeating. It should be covering your nose and your mouth and always on when you're around other people. It's just, you know, I if i may um i have a little acronym maybe you remember last time do you remember um super murray yes, yes, yes. Last time. and also um i just want to show this i'm so proud i've cranked out two more issues since i spoke with you guys the last time um super murray has a little acronym it's his holiday sweet dreams so would you like to hear it can i run through that and that might be helpful oh most oh. definitely okay uh, so dreams, the D is distance yourself. 
are respect one another and the rules of people's homes, what they're doing there. Don't be afraid to ask. Um, don't be afraid to let your wishes known. The E stands for eat and enjoy and then mask up again. Um, a, almost there, hopefully. So we need to stay diligent. The M, mask wearing. Uh, it's the polite thing to do. Considering this virus is still killing people, it's kind of a no brainer. You're, you're not only protecting yourself and even if you don't think you need protection, you are protecting others by, I said it last time, keeping your germs to yourself. Uh, and the S stands for sanitize your surfaces and use soap and warm water when you're washing your hands. And again, doing that frequently, always before you go to eat something though. Stacy, Amy with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. And along with that, you are also a nurse. Yes. So are you back in the hospital right now? Yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that is like for you and your team members? Um, sure. It is stressful, obviously. Um, we're very careful and we are very diligent. And even there too, there is a um, big range of people's opinions on all of this. So I, I feel like we are very good at being respectful towards one another, giving people space when they seem like they want it. I think um, nurses are very good at reading people. So if you can see if someone's getting stressed looking because you're closing in on their space and that, um, give people space. It's, you can, you can speak louder and that, and that's okay. But um, yes, of course, it's very stressful there. Um, but we're, we're keeping it together and we're just continuing on and we are staying diligent and trying to do the right things for people. Well, I know well, that I we all say thank you to you and all of those working on the front lines for the sacrifice that you're making to protect all of us and, and to help us survive this pandemic as well. Uh, you know, whenever you get together with friends or family right now, even if it is over a Zoom call, the conversation seems to be swinging now towards the discussion on the vaccine. So yeah. we're, over the, we're over the election. We have right. that hopefully somewhat behind us right now. But now it seems that conversation is always coming back to COVID-19, the restrictions and the vaccine. How should people handle those conversations? Again, being respectful and knowing that people have their own opinions on this is yes, a new hot topic. And again, a big range of what people think is the right thing and um, their own opinions and just try not to argue with people. You have your own opinion, you know what's right for you. And that's really all you need to worry about right now. How do you like untangle yourself from some of these conversations when you have an individual that even though you express or you try to change the um, subject, they continue on. So how do you break away from that conversation and still be polite about it? I just try to keep my words brief. Um, I'm kind of a no nonsense person when I'm practicing at work and I I mean, if people keep pushing it, um, you know, you can always just excuse yourself and step away, make an excuse. I need to use the restroom or what have you. Um, but I feel like if, you know, you're just gonna provoke people, you can tell in any conversation, if you aren't seeing eye to eye with someone, you just try to leave it alone. And, you know, or you can always say the proverbial, we can agree to disagree and smile and still be friendly. and. Just you're no, you know that people have their own opinions and you have yours and that's okay. You can just agree to disagree. Stacy Amy with us here on the Oakland County Mega Cash. She's the etiquette guru. Uh, Stacy, how did you get into this? I got into all of this because of my own daughters. Um, way back when I've been doing this 12, 13 years now. Uh, I wanted certain things for them in life and I tried to find classes and material for them and there was nothing. Um, so I started doing research on my own. I became certified in children's etiquette and a couple of years later in teen etiquette and wrote all my own material that I thought was pertinent to what I wanted for them. And um, this is kind of funny, but selfishly, initially when I started doing um, 
community center classes, I decided, well, I'll just take my girls with me and really <laughs> drive it home for them and make them hear it over and over. Um, because some of the skills like the dining etiquette, you need to practice. Um, and so that's how it all started for me. And it just took off and it's been such a wonderful blessing. And now that I'm doing the Murray Mag, I mean, I, I decided early on, I don't know where I'm going with this. I believe it will reveal itself to me and it continues to do that. So, um, and Murray Mag certainly, um, that's been hugely wonderful just for me personally, um, as a nice distraction going through these last several months. So you know, and it's so much fun. And the, the information that I want the kids to receive, um, it's so important to me. It's from my heart. And there's so, I have so many great contributors, um, just highly educated people that have shared all this information for kids to be healthy and to thrive moving forward in life. And um, two, I, I hear that kids are so sick of the Zoom situation that, um, you know, maybe parents want to consider giving them something paper to look at instead of a screen. And um, I always encourage parents, grandparents, sit with the kids, read through the things with them. Um, I purposely put a little bit higher vocabulary in this so kids will approach their parents or grandparents for help on concepts and words and things like that. So how are you managing your business uh, during the pandemic? Are you still offering classes? I am offering classes. Um, we did kind of easily transition to a Zoom situation. Um, I wouldn't say it's thriving. I think that people are sick of it. Um, but I, we also, I have a teacher, Wendy Capusta, she's wonderful. And um, we have done in-person classes and those have been so wonderful. Wearing masks, everybody, um, people are taking their temperature beforehand. Um, so it's been a very safe feeling situation and um, I definitely prefer the in-person to the Zoom. It's, a, it's that type of material, it's, it's hands-on. So what's the best age of a parent is interested in getting their kid into some of these classes or your classes? What is the best age for them to do so? I say start young. As I said, in living with my daughters and I can see that they need practice, the younger, the better. Um, I, I have etiquette 101 for children six to 12, and then I have teen etiquette and adult etiquette. Um, but the six-year-old's material, really the, the basics and the dining etiquette and the poise, it doesn't change. Um, so the sooner they learn how to command these skills, the better their life is going to be because definitely your good manners matter in life. Yeah, I was just about to ask, how has it changed through the decades? What are you seeing as, you know, what is proper, what is not, how it's changing as the world change, especially with around technology? Right, uh, so things are ever evolving as far as technology goes. Uh, I would say things haven't changed tremendously except for maybe some practices that we that are considered our norms these days those things have just evolved into other things but the basics are still the same uh still the same and just learning those basics and of course the dining etiquette it just is what it is um you want to be mindful of you know of course just running through some quick dining etiquette especially around the holidays washing your hands each and every time before you eat something warm soapy water um, watching your poise at the table around holidays especially i mean we have these special days during the year so we should treat them as such uh, sitting up straight being still what, keeping your napkin on your lap um, keeping your arms and hands in your lap or at your sides if you're not eating if you're only eating with one hand, your other hand should be in your lap, passing and serving dishes to the right and um, proper utensil use. And if people don't know what that means and they want to learn, please contact me for a class or purchase some um, instructional books and a DVD from my website. I'm theetiquetteguru.com or theetiquetteguru at yahoo.com for that. Stacey Amy with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, just another minute or two here with you on the show. Anything we didn't ask that uh, you want to fill in for our listeners and viewers at this time? Um, there is one thing or a couple of things. Please, everybody, if you are able to uh, support your local businesses during this holiday or 
during this pandemic. Um, the restaurants really need our help right now. If you can order takeout from them and support your local etiquette business <laughs> and order Murray Mag, I promise you, you will love it and your kids will like it and be entertained and learn so much. It's kind of a kid handbook. Each and every issue builds on itself. And um, it's the only thing, use your Super Murray, which is basically what's good and right within each of us. and. We can knock this COVID thing out, um, show your best manners, stay alert and aware and observant to others and their wishes, and um, just prove once again that using our Super Murray manners equals victory. We're going we're gonna to get there. We are going to get there. Hope is on the horizon. It is. Well, Stacy, Amy, thank you so much for taking time out of your Wednesday to be with us here on thank the Oakland County so Megacast. Much. Happy holidays, everybody. That's all the time we have for the Megacast Holiday Special. New episodes begin on January 4th at Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 88.1 WBFH The Bit, and 89.3 Lakes FM. I'm Erica Jones wishing you a very happy holiday season and a happy new year from all of us here at Civic Center TV. See you next year.